Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to the organizers for having me, and also for putting me on after Carlos, because that's always an easy act to follow. Um, <coughs> and so, I'm also, this is going to be something really completely different, because as opposed to really thinking about big data at the population level, I'd like for us to step back a little bit and think about what it is we need to really do to analyze individuals and individual genomes. Because if we want to aggregate that into large databases, we really want to do the best possible analysis of the individual genome. Now, before I start, I would actually like to acknowledge some people who contributed to this um, presentation, particularly the Genome Reference Consortium, because working on that project for so many years has really sharpened my thinking on genomes and genome analysis. And also David Jaffe and his team, who's actually really busy building the framework for the future of genome analysis. So it's clear that we are actually already in the era of personalized genomics. We have lots of examples of individuals who have their whole genome or their whole exome sequenced, and th that data contributes to their diagnosis or certainly to their therapeutic intervention. But I would argue that for every one of these individuals that is a success story in personalized medicine, we have plenty of examples where we don't succeed. So we still have challenges in terms of understanding how genomics impacts common disease. In terms of uh, Mendelian diagnosis, we still fail to diagnose about half of the cases that come into the clinic. And in terms of cancer treatment, an area in which genomics has arguably had a huge impact, we still struggle to have robust prognostic um, and therapeutic intervention um, completely on molecular data. Now, for those of you who are on social media, you may think that this is the argument that we should have, whether we should be doing whole genome or whole exome sequencing. And while I think this is an important discussion, I think it's really today's discussion and today's argument. And I would rather spend some time thinking about tomorrow's argument. And that is, how do we change our analysis paradigm so that we're not thinking that genome analysis is sequencing an individual, taking those reads, aligning it to a reference genome, and then coming up with a list of variants that define that genome. But how can we really think about moving to actually doing a de novo assembly of that individual genome? Now, why do I think this is important? I think it's important because we should think about what's actually in our cells. We carry two copies of each chromosome, one from our mother and one from our father. And yet, historically, this is how we've always represented our genome, as a haploid representation. Now, this started well before the Human Genome Project, and it stems back to the notion that the two copies of the chromosomes that you inherit are so similar that one representation is really good enough. So we have this haploid representation of our genome, and what it really means is that when we do an analysis of an individual genome, we're really averaging over those two alleles to try and understand it. And what it typically means is that we don't always get a complete picture of our genome. And so if you look at two genomes and you don't really have that complete picture, what can happen is you can think two things are actually more similar than they really are. It's only when you see the complete difference do you understand that, those, that they're not the same. And sometimes those differences can be wildly profound and have a huge impact on what you think about those things. So we can look at some examples about how these differences can lead to difficulties in analysis. And so when we think about sequencing an individual genome, we generate reads from both haplotypes that are colored in the individual colors in this cartoon. And using the old model from the Human Genome Project, where we would force these sequences down into a consensus haploid representation, we can end up creating what sometimes I refer to as a Franken allele. That is, you sort of weave back and forth between the two haplotypes. You can sometimes create configurations that may or may not even exist within the population. Now, in a region with pretty low diversity, um, this may not have a huge impact on your analysis. But in some cases, if there's a big difference between the two haplotypes, what we find is that much like our current political climate, it's not always possible to create consensus. And what we see here is that in these cases where you can have a large structural variation between the two haplotypes, when you go to make this consensus, you sometimes end up inserting a large gap. You can represent both alleles sometimes, completely eradicating the ability to actually analyze this region of the genome robustly. So this is why in 2011, the Genome Reference Consortium introduced the notion that maybe a haploid consensus is not really good enough to represent some of these very complex regions of the human genome. And so they introduced the notion that you should actually have two sequence or more than two sequence representation at these complex loci. And while this model is not really in common use yet, 
there is increasing data that actually this better repre sequence representation can improve analysis. And indeed, many groups like the Global Alliance for Global Health are starting to now explore these more complex models for genome representation. So here's a real life example about where this happened. So we, we look at this region on chromosome 17. Now, if we look at the top here, this blue line represents the consensus sequence. The blue clones below that are actually the individual sequence clones that can create this consensus. These green lines here represent genes. We saw, see the clinically relevant variants on this line and common variants in this line. Now, work from John Armour and others have demonstrated that, in fact, there is a common copy number variation within this region. There's a 90 KB sequence that can be present zero up to 10 times within the population. And the original donor for the human genome project that contributed to this region of the genome actually was polymorphic at this locus. And so what this did was introduce an artificial gap and a misassembly at this region. This region contains an important gene family, the chemokine ligand receptor gene family. And there have been some associations that the copy number of these genes can impact your ability to be infected by HIV, although there has certainly been some controversy about the quality of this association. And I think it's really important for us to remember, as a group who wants to do genotype-phenotype correlations, we focus so much on the importance of the phenotyping, which is clearly critical, that we sometimes forget that we have to get the genotype right as well. And if we don't get that genotype right, our ability to make these associations is going to be severely limited, even with the best models and the best phenotyping. So luckily, the DRC was actually able to correct this locus. There is access to a single haploid resource. And so this region of chromosome 17, stretching for about four megabases now, has been retiled in this one single haplotype. And so that is represented by this gray line here. This is the chromosome 17. And they also ended up creating an additional alternate sequence because it turned out that single haploid representation represented a deletion allele for that copy number variation. And so what we see when we align this alternate sequence to the chromosome, and in this alignment, this gray means there's a perfect match. The red lines indicate mismatches. And this here represents 100 KB of sequence not present in the chromosome assembly that's only present in this alternate representation that contains additional copies of this gene family. So how did we get here in this new model of, of genome and genome understanding? Well, I think technology has played a hu huge role. And in fact, it's played a huge role throughout the Human Genome Project. When the Human Genome Project started, as a matter of fact, I'm not sure anybody really knew exactly how it was going to get finished. And yet, technolo technological breakthroughs allowed us to develop a high-quality reference assembly that has been the basis of genome analysis for over a decade. After we got that assembly, there was a little bit of time about wondering exactly what we were going to do with it. And again, technological breakthroughs allowed us to be able to cheaply and easily sequence thousands of genomes. And while we don't necessarily have a complete picture of all of these genomes, they have contributed immensely to our understanding of human population diversity and the need to improve our reference models and our genome analysis. One such example we can look at, again on chromosome 17, is a locus in which there is a common inversion polymorphism that's segregating throughout the population. Now, this locus was first described by Kerry Stefanson in 2005, um, and this is commonly referred to as the MAP-T region. And we can see and the importance of this region. Uh, each of these colored boxes represents phenotypes that map into this region, including a common deletion syndrome leading to developmental delay called the 17Q21 deletion syndrome. Now, in 2005, this was the state-of-the-art understanding of this locus. So we knew there was this large inversion that spans over a megabase. And we knew the gene order was different, but not a whole lot about the sequence. And it was really thought there were just these two major haplotypes. Now, fast forward a decade, and with painstaking mapping work, improved sequencing technology, we are now able to have a much clearer picture of this region, thanks to work by Mike Zodi and Evan Eichler. And what we can see is that for each major haplotype, there are actually several sub-haplotypes, each of which can differ in sequence content by hundreds of kilobases of sequence. Importantly, only a few of these allele configurations actually have the repeat structure to mediate this deletion event having profound impacts in terms of genetic counseling and diagnostics. And so now I would argue we've had a new techno technological revolution that allows us to now consider thinking about doing individual level genome analysis 
not just on a few exemplars, but on everyone. And so the secret to this technological impact is that microfluidic high throughput partitioning system. And what this allows us to do is take high molecular weight DNA and in limiting dilution, partition these, these molecules inside what are called gel beads. In each gel bead, there are unique molecules that can be used to label that piece of DNA. And at the other end comes out um, a library that's ready for clustering on your Illumina sequencing. So we can now progress from our traditional method of resequencing a human genome, where you end up with unlinked reads, and all you really have is this short range information, to now being able to connect those short reads into longer molecules and actually harness the mo molecular information to get long range information and improve your genome analysis. And so what this really means is we can think about moving away from this paradigm of aligning reads to a genome and looking for differences to actually reconstructing the homologous loci that we see within that individual. So now it's super early days, and I'm not gonna lie to you, this is easily the best assembly that we've done, but we have se sequenced and assembled several human genomes for modest cost and modest compute. And what we're able to do in this one case is we're able to reconstruct multi-megabase segments of this individual genome where we can actually separate both haplotypes individually. And I think there's a pretty reasonable question to ask what this actually gets you. So I have time to show just one example. And this is at the neuroligand gene on human chromosome X. So this gene encodes a protein that's on neuronal cell surface, surface and is thought to be involved in synaptic remodeling. And this is an alignment of the reads from this region to the reference assembly. Just a GRCH38. Now, those, for those of you who are used to looking at these kind of alignments, you might look at this and say, well, there looks like there's something going on. There's some difference to the reference assembly here, but it's very difficult to look at this and understand how you would reconstruct the individual haplotypes that might be in this sample. However, when we go and look in the assembly itself, we can align the assembly, which is shown here. There are two lines for this assembly now because there's one for each haplotype that we can align to the reference. And so these gray boxes here represent chunks of that assembly and the red lines show how they connect. What we can now see is that one allele of this individual has an inversion polymorphism relative to the reference, while the other has deletion relative to the reference. So both alleles have a difference to, to the reference. This would be almost impossible, or certainly very difficult to sort out using a reference-based paradigm where you're trying to average over both alleles. And this gives us much more power now to think about how we can reconstruct this individual genome. So I'd like to leave you with the thought that I think what we really want to think about when we're thinking about individual genome analysis is how we can see the entire picture. And we really need to think about how we can incorporate de novo assembly on every genome, not just a few. So thank you very much.